is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. You okay if we start today off with a little game? Can we do that? Anyone interested in playing a game today? I heard one sure. All right, who's the one person I'm going to play a game with today? Okay, there's a, there's a couple. Okay, so I, I thought what we could do today is, is kind of play like speed charades, okay? I have seven things that, that I want uh, you to try and come up with the answers to what they are, okay? The game is going to be called, Who or What Are These Things, okay? And as soon as you fi- figure out what these, a- you know, based on the actions that are going to be showed to you, I just want you to yell them out. Even if your answer is wrong, we're going to keep going until you get the answer or you're close enough and you know it's not noon and we move so we can move on to the next one okay so who or what are these things and I am not super skilled at this stuff right and so I have decided to bring two experts with today to help with this improvisational act okay and so I'm going to ask Asher and Eli to come forward and they are going to play this game they're going to lead us in this game who or what are these things okay Oh, you guys are tall. All right, so, so you guys are right here. And, and, and so they have seven different things that they are going to do written down right there. And as soon as I say go, they are going to start acting these things out without words. You can make sounds if you want to, but you can't do words. Without words. And, um, and you guys just yell it out when you have it. So first one, ready, go. Old man, close, close, close. Elderly, yes. Gr- grandparent, we'll go with that. Elderly grandfather, quick, next, next, next. <laughs> you can see the skill going on here. We're, uh, lightsaber, we're getting closer. The force, I heard it. Somebody said the force. The force is correct. Next. Judge. Judge, correct, with a gavel. Next. Okay, but let them let them at least do it. Come on, don't you want to see it? I, I want to see him sit on the lap or whatever they're gonna do. <laughs> what are you a tree? Okay, Santa Claus is correct. All right, so what's the next one? Friend, best friends is correct. A best friend. What's next? Keep moving up to the front of the stage. <laughs> yes, vending machine is correct. And one more. <laughs> yes, a royal king on his throne is correct. That's all seven. Can you give them a round of applause? No using the pillow during the message. That's all I have to say, okay? Thank you guys for doing that. I will have to take you out to lunch or something later. Um, so, so as fun as that was, I, I chose these seven things for a very, very particular reason. Take a look at the list that's on the screen um, and, and, look, and just think about it. And, and why would I have chosen these seven items? Just, just think about it. I mean, you could yell something out if you want to, but just think about this list. Just for a moment. And I would let you know that oftentimes this is the list of what most people tend to view God as being like. Think about it. 
There's a lot of people out there, and maybe even in the church as well, that views God as an elderly grandfather, somebody with this long flowing beard that I don't even know where they got it from, which makes me nervous, right? And yeah, yeah, we just keep one in our room just in case, right? Sorry, officer, I'm actually 87. Here's my ID. I don't know where they got it, right? Um, but, but sometimes we think of him as an elderly grandfather type figure, right? Uh, somebody who just kind of loves people or something like that. Oftentimes, uh, people think of God as just this force that's kind of out there. Uh, and some people see God as, as somebody who's there to just judge. No! Guilty! People out there think of God that way. Some people see God as Santa Claus. Right? If you're good, God will do good things for you. If you're bad, God's going to do bad things for you. There are people out there that view God as just a best friend. Do you know how popular Buddy Jesus is right now? Do you know what Buddy Jesus is, this figure? People love having Buddy Jesus. They purchase him, they hang him in their car, he's all around. See, they view Jesus as this best friend that they can just have and hang out with whenever they want to. Take Buddy Jesus wherever I go. Or that God is this vending machine where I can go to God whenever I want and, and I can just say, hey God, I need this. And then the expectation is, is God's just going to provide? Or that God is just this king sitting on his throne doing whatever God wants. I mean, do these sound familiar? For some of us, this may be even the way that we think about God. I mean, it's true. Well, Jesus... He'd taken his disciples, and, and he, he took them up on a mountain, and he sits them down, and he just starts teaching them about the kingdom of God. Now, there were multitudes that had gathered around as well. So they just, they were, they were fascinated by this Jesus guy. And he had done some miracles, and so they're, they just, they're, they're listening to him, and they're finding out this extraordinary stuff. And so Jesus is talking to them. And, and, and as he was talking to him, he, he gets to this time where he starts talking about prayer. And, and actually, he talks about the things that they shouldn't do in prayer. And, and he specifically says, when you're praying, don't pray to impress other people. That, that, that's not what we do in prayer. And when you're praying, don't just babble on and on. What, what he's saying is, 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 is your goal is to pray to God, not so, so that other people are listening to how awesome you are? And get to the point. For some of us, we're, we're saying, oh, what a relief. All I really need to do is get to the point when I'm talking to God. I, I think that's what Jesus was saying. And then he starts to talk about how he would want us to pray. And he, start, he teaches us what we now call as the Lord's Prayer, which is what we're going to be getting into in these next seven weeks. But, but it's really interesting because we now, uh, we now call it the Lord's Prayer. And actually, we have this, this little uh, uh, image right here. Uh, Tracy Huff, somebody from our church, she cross-stitched this years ago. And I think it was up in her grandmother's house. It was a gift that, that she had given away. And, and so this is just the picture, the image that a lot of us have of the, of the Lord's Prayer that, that I want us to be keeping in our heads all, all through these next couple months as we're thinking about prayer. But here's the interesting, fascinating thing about the Lord's Prayer. Nowhere in Scripture is it called that. And after Jesus shares this in teachings, nobody from that point on ever prays this prayer in Scripture. I think what Jesus was doing is trying to teach us a model of how we should pray. I actually wonder if we should be calling this the model prayer, not the Lord's prayer. Not like I'm trying to fit for a change here, right? I, I thought about us as saying the Lord's prayer each and every week while we did this, but then I struggled with it because I don't think that was the point that Jesus wanted us to do in this. I, I, I don't think he wanted us to, to go away just thinking that that's what, that's, what, that's what he wanted. I think he wants us to understand why he was saying these things in the prayer. So we're going to take a few weeks and we're just going to look at it. And hopefully come home or go home 
and be people who are excited, maybe passionate about prayer more than we've ever been before. Lord, would you help us today as we begin to unpack this prayer, this model for us, to see what it's all about. And God, help me and all of us to be people that are willing to have our eyes, our hearts, our minds opened to prayer. That I would be willing to learn from you, your spirit working in my life, that we would be willing to let your spirit show us what prayer is all about, and today specifically the object of our prayer. May the words that I share and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, for you are our rock and our blessed Redeemer. Amen. So Jesus, after telling them, don't pray to impress other people, and, and don't just babble on in your prayers. He says, this then is how you ought to pray. And he starts off by saying, our Father in heaven. And we're just going to stop right there. We're going to unpack what I think Jesus was trying to help people understand. Because this part of the prayer already would have caused people to stop and say, wait, what? What did you just say? Because what, what they were used to was people not even acknowledging the name of God. God was, was so big, so amazing, so powerful. I mean, they viewed him as the all-knowing, all-seeing, everywhere God, right? And, and in their culture, they weren't even allowed to say his name. That's, how, that's, that's what God was like. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is saying in your prayers, I, I want you to call him Father, Father, and he starts to bring out this word, trying to help them to understand that there is a sense of intimacy in prayer. God isn't meant to be something distant, certainly something powerful, certainly something with authority over all. This is the God of the heavens, right? Right? But it's also a God who knows that, that us being willing, being willing to be in a relationship with him can bring a joy and a peace in our lives that we can't find anywhere else. And so Jesus is saying, stop thinking of God as being far away. Stop thinking of God as being up there, out there. Someone that's only there when we come to him. Think of God as the absolute best, perfect father you could imagine. But the one who is in heaven and Lord over all. So who is this father in heaven. Who is this, this, this God that, that Jesus is now trying to teach his disciples, the followers of Jesus, is trying to teach them to say, you can have this sense of intimacy with him. Who is this God? And we're going to do this each and every week. We're going to start here and then we're going to jump to another passage of scripture to hopefully help us to understand who or what we're talking about. And so let's jump to Psalm 103 and begin to understand who this one that we pray to is. And, and King David here, uh, he's writing this psalm of, of really of praise to God. And he starts off by saying, praise the Lord, my soul. And already we have to stop because cause what do these words mean? If you know me, you know words matter. And the word praise, it means to bless. It, it means literally to go on bended knee. 
And so imagine that you're going through life and then all of a sudden you realize that you want to praise God. If you go on bended knee, can you keep moving? No. And that's the image of what David is trying to say. That even in the midst of the craziness of your life, even in the midst of my, me being king of the entire nation, right? Even in the midst of me being the commander of an army that, that has to move forward in battle. I know that there are times in my life where I just have to stop and praise the Lord. Years ago, I, I think it was like 1994 or something, I decided to get my, the endorsement, the motorcycle endorsement, because I, I wanted to ride motorcycle. I had the long flowing hair. I looked like Lorenzo Lamas and Renegade, if you know what I'm talking about, right? So I was, I was pretty much all that, or at least that's what I thought. Nobody else did. And, and, and so, so I'm going to get the certification and, and before, or the, the endorsement. And before that, if you went there like an hour or two before, they had the course set up and somebody could run you through so you could do the practice stuff and they could teach you the areas um, that you would struggle with so you could be successful and pass the class. All right, and so, so I'm going to the class to, to do this, and, and I had been warned ahead of time, you sh shouldn't have any issues with any of, of the class, with the exception of there's one very sharp turn that you have to take with your motorcycle. And, and most people, when they take the sharp turn, they put their foot down because they're afraid that they're going to lose the control of the bike. And, and so actually what I was told was, so if you can get the lightest motorcycle possible, um, you really shouldn't have any issues. So I I actually went in on like a Honda 200 or 300 or whatever, and I, and I passed the test pretty easily because of that. Call it cheating if you want. I call it passing the test. I got my endorsement. But, so, so we get there, and we're all going through the, te the, the test, and most of the stuff is not an issue, but most of the people, when it came to the sharp turn, they would put their foot down because they were afraid that they, were, they, they, would, they would drop the bike, and nobody wants to drop a bike, Right? And so, so practice again and again. People are getting frustrated, and, and the guy who's running the course, he's just, he's just kind of smiling at us. And, and the people are getting very, very angry. And one of the people actually says, are you sure that that's how sharp it has to be? And, and the guy says, well, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. And he says, he says the issue isn't the course. The issue is, is you're doing it wrong. And, uh, and so he said, here, uh, let me give you uh, uh, some advice. And he says, each and every one of you, as you are driving, you continue to look forward. But when you're at the very, very sharp turn, what you need to do is stop looking forward and look into the turn. If you were to turn your head and look into the turn so you see exactly where you're going, not just the direction you're heading, but look exactly where you're going, you will be able to make the turn without having to put your foot down. And sure enough, as everyone started going through the course and looking into the turn, even though the direction they were ending up was that way, they were able to make the turn without putting their foot down. And, and I was one of the first people to go, and I passed the test, and, and I saw that the next person passed the test, and I, I assume everyone else passed the test because of the practice, all of a sudden everyone started to get it. And why? Because we took our focus off of where we thought that we were going to focus on getting into the turn. We had to do this in order to continue going that way. And I think that's what David is trying to help people understand in this psalm, that there are times in our lives where we just have to stop and just praise the Lord. We have to get our focus on just blessing God. And if we have to, if we have to get on bended knee in order to get our attention on God, as opposed to on what we're doing and where we're heading and where we're going, then do it. That's what he's saying. Praise the Lord. Bless God. Get on bended knee. My soul is talking about the inmost part of me, the part of me that connects with God. I want, I want to stop so that I can connect with God somehow, some way. All my inmost being, everything inside me. What David is trying to do is paint an image of look in a mirror deep as far as you can. I encourage you to stop right now. Look in a mirror. Imagine yourself looking in a mirror as far as you can. Deep inside yourself. I don't know what you see. 
but whatever you see, now praise God. God, what I see, I'm thankful for. Or God, what I see is a little bit ugly. But I praise you. I praise your holy name. I think this is what David was trying to get us to do. Praise God. And then he says it again. You know, uh, when, when something is repeated, I, I try to tell us, I think it's because the, the writer is trying to let us know how important this is. And what we're going to find out is, is this praise the Lord thing is said six times. When, when it's twice, it's important. What happens when it's six times? I, I, I don't even know. I mean, that's, that's how big of a deal this is. Or, 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 or how David's trying to get us to, to just stop often in our lives and just remember that, that God is there and that God loves us. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not his benefits. We're starting to think, score, we get something out of this, right? Benefits here means invaluable actions. It's not necessarily talking about some awesome stuff that we get out of this, but there are some invaluable things that God does for us. What are these things? What are these invaluable actions that God does for us that we ought to stop every once in a while in our lives, and just thank God for. Because he's the one who forgives our sins. All the stuff where we mess up and fail and forget God and just wander on in our own life, which I do all the time. He forgives us of those things. And then with each and every one of these verses, it, the first line is connected to the next line. And the next line is connected to the next line. And we just have to remember that as we move forward, forward with this. So he forgives our sins, and then he heals all our diseases. The diseases here is connected to the sin. Because when we do something that is against what God wants, there's a ripple effect that goes on in our lives. And it causes a negative impact on us and the world around us. And when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, he does. And he begins to work on helping to heal the outcome, the disease that happens because of our sin. That begins to get restored. And then it says, he redeems your life from the pit. Oh man, there's so much here. I wish you understood it. The word redeem here, it's connected to the word, the kinsman redeemer. You know what a kinsman redeemer is? It's the picture of, of, a, of a husband and a wife and the husband ends up, ends up dying and now the wife is all alone and whatever debt that the husband had, she's, she's now stuck with. And what is she going to do? Or, or, or a child is now alone and what, what is that child going to do? And then all of a sudden, somebody walks in, and it's typically a relative, right? Somebody walks in and says, I will take care of you. I, I, I will pay off all the debts. I will marry you. I, I, will, I will take you as my child. I will, I, will, I will bring you and let you be a part of my family. Whatever it takes, I will take care of you. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Isn't that an invaluable action from God? Isn't that worthy of just, just stopping and saying, God, I'm so thankful that you redeemed my life from the pit, from the debt of the things that I am responsible for? Pit here means death and adversity. And in the midst of that redemption of what God does for us, taking us away from death and adversity, he crowns us with love in compassion. This is where we ought to be. And God says, instead, this is what I'm going to give you. Love. Compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. And David, of course, what he's talking about when he says the desires is the desires to follow God. And as we follow God with our heart, the man after God's own heart, He's going to give us the good things that we need to follow God with all our heart. 
And as that happens, our youth, the energy, the excitement, the passion to live for him is renewed like the eagles. The amazing strong bird that can soar. One that we pray to desires only good for us. When Jesus is saying, our father, what? Father? That's not what we're used to hearing. Yeah. He desires good for you. He loves you. David continues on in verse 10. And, and as, the, as the passage goes, it says, As high as the heavens are above, so great is his love for those who fear him. Now, there's a bunch to unpack here, right? But, but getting to the word fear, fear is one of those things where you understand the authority of God and you're willing to submit, right? This isn't, this isn't a, I'm afraid. You understand that God is sovereign. God is ruler over all, and I am willing to submit. And now if you understand that, and it says as high as the heavens are above, you, you look out and you see the stars and how vast and how limitless it is. You cannot see the end. That's how great God's love is. Now, if you were to look at the language of God's great love, it is a fascinating thing because it actually focuses in on, on two key pieces of God's love. And one piece is, is God's faithfulness, that, that those who are willing to look at God and see the vastness of his love, right, but that he is sovereign and say, I am willing to submit to you and what you want for my life. For those of us who are willing to look to that and submit to that, God's great love begins to pour out on us. And one of the key things that God's great love shows us is his faithfulness. God will not be fickle to us. God will not change his mind ever in regards to us. God will be faithful to us. And then the other thing that, that God's great love focuses on is his kindness to us. He will always be kind to us. He will always be there to help us. Those who are willing to surrender to him, those who will fear him, and then we understand that even in the midst of surrendering to him, we still mess up. So David goes on to say, and so as far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed our transgressions from us. And we understand the picture of the east is from the west, right? You start walking east, when are you going to hit west? Never, right? And so that's the picture of what's going on. That's as far as how, as how we removed our transgressions are. Our transgressions are when a, a boundary has been crossed, right? An, an illegal action has taken place. And God sends that illegal action on a journey heading east and says, go find west, and it never will. God says, you sin. Those of you who surrender to me, I will forgive you. And I'll let your transgressions go away. And I'm not going to let them come back. I'm not going to hold that against you. They've been removed. And then he talks about the father. Once again, we hear it. A father has compassion as a father has compassion on his children. Now, the word compassion here means tender affection. Hear that word, people. Because some of us don't have great fathers. And that's not what David is talking about. As a father has tender affection on his children. You know, someone once said that a father is somebody who has pictures where his money used to be. I've always loved that image. But God is somebody who, in a sense, has our pictures and all the resources to help us. And he chooses to be tender with us and love us. And as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has tender affection, again, on those who are willing to surrender to him. Our Father in heaven, the one that we pray to, is our compassionate Father. And then David goes on saying, the Lord, the Lord has established his throne in heaven. 
The God, the one that we pray to, is Almighty God. And, and, and I feel like David here is beginning to swell up and just remind himself that, that not only is God, does God love us, not only does God take care of us, he's Almighty God. He is something beyond extraordinary. He is beyond comprehension. He, he is so significant and so huge that, that we, we can't just remember and think about just his compassion because he's everything. The Lord's established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over everything. Praise the Lord. Now, now he's not just talking to us. He starts talking to the angels if he can, right? He's saying, angels, stop. Get on bended knee. You mighty ones who do his bidding. You ones who obey his word. I mean, it's not just us who should be praising God. We ought to be. But the angels, you ought to be praising God as well. Praise the Lord, all you heavenly hosts. And he starts talking about the armies of God. Everyone out there. Everyone in the, in the heavenly realms. The things that I cannot see. You, his servants, who do his will. Stop. Everyone, stop. Let's praise God. Let's bend our knees to God. Praise the Lord, he says again. All his works everywhere. And now he's not even talking to people or angelic beings. He's talking to every single thing on earth. You want to know how powerful, how amazing, how super God is? Everything around us, including you, including me, should be stopping and kneeling and praising God. That's what David was trying to help us understand who this God is. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion, which is everywhere. Every single thing that God has done and created, praise God. And that's how he ends it. Praise the Lord. But he goes back to himself, my soul. And now that I've thought and I've heard and I've seen these things, he says, I need to look back in the mirror. And so I invite all of us now, once again, look in the mirror again. Where am I at when I, since I've heard these things about who God is, about his goodness, about the compassionate Father, and that he is the Almighty God, may I stop right now? Look in the mirror, deep at who I am. Who God is. And now praise God. God, I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. A lot of times I don't feel that way. But your word says it. And so I trust your word. God, I praise you for your goodness. God, I praise you for your affection towards me. And I praise you that you are in control of my life. I know that I can trust you. God, as I, as I look in the mirror, I see that I often do not trust you. For that, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And thank you for cleansing me of my sin and restoring me. Thank you for your love and your mercy. And thank you for the ability to be able to stand today once again, restored and being able to walk with you and for you. God, help me to remember to bless you and praise you throughout the day. I am yours. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, 
just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebittenchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.